Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Off Base, the show where we break down the upcoming so rare MLB slate. During the show, we will cover all things game week 38, including injuries, rookies, starting pitching, bullpen options, stacks, and three for three, where we will go back and forth talking three undervalues and three overvalues. I am joined alongside Nick. He writes so rare MLB content on Ethersport, where you can find the so ranks every Thursday morning. Nick, how's it going? Howdy, howdy. It's it's going pretty well. I've spent multiple hours at the DMV today, so really just, you know, ask me anything at this point. I'm <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah, DMV, not fun, uh, but this game week, this past game week has been pretty fun. I know you had a good team. Uh, Jose Ramirez mm-hmm. didn't quite come through for you. <laughs> uh, Want to tell the tell the story about that? Oh, I, I actually thought he was serving his suspension because I haven't <laughs> looked at a, a lot of... Um, the live stuff this week i've been kind of in and out of town and so i was like oh okay jose got in a fight i screwed that up lo and behold that lineup goes off and so i'm sitting in like eighth in rare all-star as we record this and i thought he was serving a suspension and i was like well okay fine as you told me before this uh he's not serving his suspension he just sucked this week so <laughs> i have i have no leg to stand on i completely missed that somehow and what could have been if I had just started almost any of the other guys I had some faith in on the week. I, I would have been right in the mix of it. But this week I'll finish probably just out. Yeah, I feel that. I, uh, I have a top 100 team in limited pro right now. And I have nice. Freddie Peralta, the top scoring pitcher of the game week, Freddie Peralta, on my limited all-star team. Uh, I got Max Scherzer on the pro team. So it's a minus like yep. 20 so rare point difference there. That's a little, it's a and little that rough. starts to matter. That's a <laughs> but, big um, 20 points. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's been rough, but Hey, still top hundred can't complain. Nice. And that's um, great. with that, we will move on to game week 38 here. So what we are going to do first before I pull up any graphics is read the multi-game monitor. Cause we have some interesting ones this week usually yeah. you have all teams playing three over on the weekend slate but we have two teams that are playing a double header on saturday that is the braves and the mets so they will both have four games big advantage for them we also have two teams playing two games this week cardinals and the royals uh, they are not playing on sunday so a little bit different here uh nick any any thoughts on braves mets how much are you prioritizing them this week uh pretty high i mean both of those guys or both of those teams are just littered with stars too. So if you're heavy and Braves, like obviously start them. Um, the really, the only big thing I'm really keying into this weekend is we've got the two game things. So those Cardinals that you've got studs from and the Royals where Bobby Witt's been playing so well, like no go, especially not with a couple teams on four game weeks. So that's, that's the more downside. Um, nobody needs me to tell them to start their their studs from the Mets and the Braves. Yeah, absolutely. And we can move on to our injury update here. I will pull up our graphic. Uh, One notable guy returning, that's Clayton Kershaw. Uh, Dave Roberts said it is very likely that he will return this week to make his start. So that is good for the Dodgers. Uh, As far as players who are out, we have Shane McClanahan, he is unlikely to return this season due to left a left forearm injury. He will join Jeffrey Springs, Shane Baz, Drew Rasmussen, and I think there's another one that I'm missing, who are all out for the season for the Rays. Tough for them. Uh, we also have Ronald Acuna Jr. He left Tuesday's game after being hit on the elbow. He is day-to-day. I believe he is back already, but of course that one was scary for him. He's had an awesome season. Um, don't want to Miss out on him for their World Series run like they did in, in 2021, uh, I believe, when he wasn't there. Um, we also have Josh Jung. He'll undergo surgery on his left thumb. He will be out about six weeks. Carlos Rodon placed on the IL with a left hamstring strain. Starling Marte was placed on the IL with a right groin strain. Zach Greinke was placed on the IL with elbow soreness. And Kevin Kiermeyer was placed on the IL after cutting his elbow, leaping for a ball at Fenway Park. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so, uh, Nick, any analysis on those injuries? Man, I, Rodon's sad because it was we were finally like getting to see him again, and he has so much talent. So to see him go right back onto the IL, that sucks. And Granky, I, I'm going to make sort of light of this, but like 
he was sort of the anchor of the Royals rotation. <laughs> so the the whole premier hitters against the Royals thing just got even better, um, which is tough to say that they've been one of the best ones to stream, stream against. And so poor Granky, um, that stinks. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, R- Royals pitching getting even worse. Hard to imagine. <laughs> it's, it's impossible to even think about, but here we are. Yeah. All right. All right. We're going to talk about rookies real quick. I think we have one notable one. Uh, a Mariners pitcher was called up from double A. Uh, that is Emerson Hancock. So, Nick, would you talk about him briefly and then uh, some other sort of rookie strategy that we have uh, now going to September with some of the rookie call ups and stuff like that? Sure thing. So, Hancock is, I believe, the Mariners' number four prospect. Um, they called him up from double A directly. So that's kind of fun. He s- skips triple A entirely. And as of right now, his profile is more like control over raw stuff. Um, but he is very highly ranked as far as like prospect pedigree goes. I'm just not sure I see it all yet. But we've seen stuff with, say, like George Kirby, where he has amazing control. And then that stuff continues to improve. So. Definitely one to watch, but maybe not one to like get super jacked up about right now. Um, but the other note I wanted to kind of throw out here is we're in early August right now. And as we get towards late August, it gets to be a really interesting time for rookies. And this thought kind of came from, I was listening to the Rates and Barrels pod from the Athletic guys, and they were just outlining some very interesting rookies to look for as the season comes to a close. But the underlying thread of all of that was that we see this more and more with teams as they're managing service time, where when they have a top prospect, one that they're really, really excited about, um, a lot of times they'll bring them up here at the end of the season to give them about a month of a debut before they get into next season where they can earn that whole rookie of the year um, extra pick compensation thing. And... So we saw it last year. The biggest one that is the most obvious is Corbin Carroll, but I believe Gunnar Henderson did this as well. And we see it sort of year in and year out where top prospects each year come up and they get about a month's worth of at-bats without screwing up their service time and still leading to them be able to be designated as a rookie next year. So as we start to see some prospects called up, if it's a big notable one, it's maybe not as vital to look at them for what they can do for you this year, although that could be valuable. But these are the ones that the team is saying, we want them to get at bats right now and get sort of an exposure to big league pitching before they go for their official debut season next season. So just something to put on your radar as you look at what the teams are doing. And as we see the news, this is an interesting way to kind of filter through the news of, okay, maybe he can't do a bunch for me right now, but these are the guys that the teams really believe in. Yeah, I know. I like that. Uh, Corbin Carroll, Gunnar Henderson come to mind. Like you said, you know, these guys that sometimes you get confused, you know, they're actually rookies, but they did play last year, but just briefly. Um, exactly. But yeah, I think Vargas was one last year and he didn't maybe pan out for the Dodgers, but we're seeing that Gunnar and Corbin Carroll, especially, they did this last year because they believed in them. And lo and behold, they've been really, really good this season. So maybe that extra month of at-bats even helped a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And last year, uh, Diamondbacks and Orioles not going to make the playoffs. So kind of a, a way to test out their, their farm system and, and give some of their prospects some reps. So, yeah, good stuff there. Definitely something to keep your eye out for these teams that are um, not going to make the playoffs and, and are just trying to – Um, test out their their young players all right so we should start to see that probably in the next couple weeks like last week of august is when a lot of this like you can call them up without really worrying too much about their service time yeah good stuff there all right gonna pull up our first graphic our second graphic starting pitchers streamers uh we are going to talk about some pitchers we like for this game week game week 38 and Nick, I will tee it off to you. Who is the pitcher you got your eye on this week? All right. Well, we've talked about him as a buy low for what feels like months now. Um, but quietly, 
Brandon Woodruff came back and just struck out nine guys over five innings in his return to the Brewers. So he's back. Um, he got the loss. He gave up a couple runs. Like that's all well and good. But in five innings, he struck out nine guys after being off for multiple months. And I took that as a very, very good sign that he's basically just back to being Brandon Woodruff. Like there's not going to be this big, long ramp up period or anything like he's already through that. And this week he draws the White Sox who rank 28th out of 30 teams in team WRC plus, which is pretty darn appealing. And they are top 10 in team strikeout rate as well. And if Luis Robert is out with his finger injury that I think he's day to day on, then they don't get any better. Uh, so this is a very, very appealing matchup. And Woodruff, he's been a wonderful buy low for a long time. And I think he's still kind of in that, that range just because he is so early from being back from injury that you can kind of squeak him off of the open market and have an ace caliber pitcher right from the start this weekend. Yeah. And he had that nine struggle game, like really quietly too. I know you messaged me about it and I was like, no, I haven't yeah. seen that. And then I looked into it. I was like, wait, he did go out there and strike out nine guys. Like no one was yeah. talking about this. Like you said, did get the loss, gave up you know, yeah. a run or two. Um, but yeah, we know Woodruff is, has really good stuff and, and has been a buy low for a while because people don't really know about him and talk about him. Um, so I like that, that call a lot. And um, to segue into my, picks yeah uh, really also, easy segue for you here i also like the brewers pitchers as you can see here we have three out of our four guys are brewers pitchers uh nick mentioned the the white Sox and kind of the struggles they have been having lately um they have been winning games since the the brawl i think they're like four and one or something um but they do you know rank high in the strikeout department you know third to last or whatever in wrc plus something like that um and then very low in, in Woba and ISO numbers as well. So I like targeting them right now. Uh, so the Brewers get them this week. And really all three of these guys I like. But I will talk about Corbin Burns and Freddie Peralta. Uh, Burns has been so steady since the beginning of July. He has allowed no more than two earned runs in a game. And he's pitched no less than six innings per game. He has a 30.5 strikeout rate, which is 12th in the league. He has shrunk his XFIP down to a ninth best 2.85 mark. Um, and then Freddie Peralta, too. I think he's going Sunday. Uh, he is coming off a 13 strikeout game against the Rockies. Probably won't do that again. Um, as we talked about, I did not have him on my limited pro team, and that was unfortunate. But um, he also looks like he's in a good spot this week. He has a 26.9% strikeout rate on the year, which is good. And he has a $9 floor price on his limited. Burns has a $20 floor price on his limited. It's come up quite a bit. But I like them both as plays. All right, back over to you. All right. Remind me, I have a question about um, the Brewers later when we get to relief pitchers. Um, gotcha. But the, the segues continue of on the other side of this Brewers-White Sox matchup, we have Dylan Cease. And... There's a lot to like here for him as well. Um, so Cease is for the White Sox. You mentioned they're playing a little bit better. He might get a little bit of run support. But all on his own, he has very, very appealing strikeout rates. If you can stomach a slightly higher than average walk rate, um, maybe a little bit more than slightly higher than average, he has a ton of upside here because lo and behold, the Brewers rank seventh in strikeout rate. So they strike out even more than the White Sox and they're 25th in team WRC plus. So they're, they're not much better than the White Sox. So it's possible. We just see a whole bunch of pitching happen amongst these four guys and not a lot of runs scored um, from these teams, which would mean Dylan Cease is sort of an under the radar. Hasn't been playing all that well. Um, kind of bargain basement, almost ace here. And He's, a, he's another one, kind of like Woodruff, where you can pick him up, and he should be good for a very long time for you. Yeah, I like that. And uh, Cease, one of those guys I thought might get traded. Uh, I know the White Sox trade away two other pitchers, uh, Lynn and yeah. someone else I can't remember. Giolito. Giolito, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, Cease stayed with them, and like you said, he has a high strikeout rate but a high walk rate. 
Uh, he's another one of those, you know, DFS sort of plays I like with that that K rate. Um, but he does have that walk issue. All right. I the last guy I want to talk about is Blake Snell. Uh, this play feels a little uh, risky to me. Not not totally a play that I like to to the kind of pitcher he ha- he's leading the league in ERA, but then he his uh, xFIP is at three point two one, which is twenty third in the league. So I'll probably do so do for some regression there. But he is facing Arizona, who has been slumping lately. On July 1st, the D-backs were 16 games above 500. They now sit with an even 57 and 57 record. Um, Over the last two weeks, Arizona struck out the seventh highest rate, and they ranked bottom 10 in ISO, WOBA, and WRC+. Um, So Snell does have good strikeout stuff, eighth in the league in strikeout rate at 32%. Some of the ERA and XFIP numbers do worry me. feels a little scary, but um, I do think he makes sense as a play against this cold offense. Uh, Nick, any additional thoughts on Snellzilla? The only additional thing is that 23rd in XFIP is still pretty darn good. So like right. if he's regressing, he's still regressing to a, a very, very startable guy. Um, so I, I like the play there. You're right. Something just doesn't feel right here. And maybe we'll just end up being wrong and that's fine. But um, there are other guys that I'm very excited about there their matchup and sort of their the the feel of what this weekend holds and Snell I just don't have the same excitement for whatever reason yeah yeah it makes sense to me all right moving on to bullpen and I'll talk about this quickly we do have the two teams playing four games Braves and Mets uh so right away Rysel Iglesias stands out as a really good play uh, the Mets have kind of have a rotating cast of characters at closer. The depth chart had three guys listed, actually. Um, Adam Ottavino pictured here, Drew Smith, Brooks Raley. They did trade away David Robertson to Miami before the trade deadline. Um, so, Nick, are you looking at Rysel Iglesias as far and ahead, the top guy? And who else do you like? Yeah, this kind of cues up the question I was going to ask. So, Iglesias is definitely my favorite closer on the weekend. But... I was wondering, is it weird to say Devin Williams is my second favorite? Because we just kind of outlined that we love all three Brewers pitchers for the weekend. And like three saves in a row is a lot to ask. But there's a good chance there's some save opportunities coming out of that. Would you, Is there anybody besides Iglesias you would play over Devin Williams? I don't think so. I have Devin Williams in there as well. Um yeah, I would say those two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because even those Mets guys, like you want to play because four games, but then I, I really don't know where to go there. So yeah, Williams makes sense to me. Okay, because like I love Munoz, which we've got pictured here. He's got, I think, at least two of the Mariners starters are pretty high caliber this weekend. But yeah. Williams with all three, like if you've got him, fire him up for sure. Um, three games or, or not. Yeah, and and even you know recommending Cease on the other side kind of says that we think that game could stay close. Having a good pitcher mm-hmm. on the other side, you know, yeah. it's not like they're just going to blow out the White Sox um, potentially. Yeah. And so we've seen Kopech kind of fire it up from time yeah. to time too. So like two of the White Sox pitchers, while they're a little bit volatile, they can have really good games. Yeah, I like that, and I like the Munoz pick as well um, that you got there picture here on the left love me some Munoz yeah <laughs> ever I, since I, he he got the job man yeah I know I said that right after uh Seawold was traded I do think Munoz is going to be featured a lot on the, the top reliever chart as the season goes on so all right that's some good bullpen strategy for this week yeah. we can move on to one last thing um, oh yeah go ahead maybe not as high quality as some of the ones we've just been talking about but the Rays have three very solid guys pitching this weekend uh, against, I believe the guardians. Um, so Pete Fairbanks is definitely in play as well. Um, he's, yeah. he doesn't get like all of the save chances. I don't think the rays are kind of weird that way. Um, but still very, very good matchup and good starting pitchers to kind of bode well for his chances. 
Yeah, I like that too. And um, the Guardians have been pretty cold since uh, the fight as well. <laughs> yeah. The Guardians have been cold and the White Sox have been hot. They won the, fight, they, won the fight. Ramirez won the fight. I don't I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> yeah, probably just some variance there. But um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a narrative, dang it. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to stacking matchups. And um, I will tee it off to you, Nick, to start. Who do you have your eye on this week? All righty. Well, this doesn't seem as surprising now that I checked my scores for this week, and Cabrian Hayes is just playing awesome. But Pittsburgh is in a wonderful spot up against Cincy this weekend. Um, Pittsburgh has been mediocre these past few months, but with all the guys hurt, I don't know if we can kind of grade them off of that. And we've got both of the Bryans back. We've got Brian Reynolds and we've got Cabrian Hayes. And that lineup gets a lot better with both of them in it. Plus, they get Cincy, which Andrew Abbott is the first one they'll be facing. Maybe he continues to be what we've seen, but we're both expecting some regression there. Behind that, they get Brandon Williamson and Luke Weaver, which if you um, don't generally start those guys, none of us blame you because those are two of the more appealing guys to stream against. So Pittsburgh, these guys come pretty cheap. And they're in a wonderful spot. I've got them second only to the Dodgers this week. And three games of just great matchups is pretty darn solid, even with a couple four gamers out there. Yeah, I like that. Uh, When I first looked at this, I was like, wait, Pittsburgh, Oakland ahead of Atlanta. Um, But, you know, obviously pitching matchup is is factored into that. Um, You know, I'll talk about Atlanta right now, what with their, who they're facing on the Mets. But, um, but yeah, Cincinnati pitching bad, Washington, you know, really bad. Even though it's Oakland, I mean, they could they could get to some of those Washington pitchers for sure. Yeah. And like the stacks, I mean, you don't need us to to tell you to stack all of your Braves. Yeah. But like the fact that they're fourth is really appealing. And then Oakland and Pittsburgh, there are some screaming values hiding in there that you can just sort of sprinkle in and probably have a lot of good luck with yeah yeah that makes sense like like a three-man brave stack and like you know the studs olsen riley acuna mm-hmm. and then you do a little two-man with uh, a couple of oakland guys mm-hmm. you know, maybe a couple cabrian hayes and brian reynolds a little brian mini stack on the pirates yeah. and uh i kind of like that I, it could be a nice way to get some leverage on everybody because i don't think most people are going to look at this and go yeah let me start my pirates and my athletics <laughs> right so yeah absolutely that could be all right well i alluded to it the braves are a stack that stood out to me four games this week against the mets they're going to face tyler mcgill jose quintana kodai senga and carlos carrasco so you know not bad pitchers right i mean the mets did trade away their top two arms but i mean they have these you know carrasco quintana those are veterans senga has been good um, but still the Braves, they are first in ISO, third in Woba, seventh in WRC plus. Um, yeah, Mets kind of quit on the season. And um, you know, this team is expensive. Ronald Acuna is limited price, almost over two hundred dollars. Um wow. had an injury scare, but he is back. Um, yeah, Sean Murphy can be bought for cheap. I know people don't love catchers, but he has does have a seven dollar limited price. Um yeah, Braves, pretty obvious, pretty chalky. Um, any thoughts on them, Nick? And then uh, who else do you like? I, I think you're dead on. That's that's the chalk this week. So yeah. either lean all the way into it and do you know a big Brave stack and go for it, or I don't know, maybe fade them entirely and hope that this kind of middle of the road um, Mets team or Mets rotation can kind of just keep them at bay. Is it's not like the most beautiful of matchup on any given day, but four games worth of it with the Braves is pretty hard to ignore. Yeah. All right, back over to you for another stack. All right. Well, we kind of touched on this one, but Oakland draws the Washington pitching staff, and it's one we've been sort of picking on a little bit more lately. And outside of um, just a couple guys there that Oakland's not expected to face, Washington doesn't have a lot in terms of pitching firepower to be scared of. So if you've got some of those young 
kind of guys that were hot earlier in the season for Oakland and were a little bit exciting and are fun to watch when they're hot. Like this is a week where you can kind of just drop them in there and hope for the best because while there may be not every week kind of starting caliber guys, this is a very, very good matchup. And like we said earlier with the Pittsburgh guys, Oakland players for the most part come pretty darn cheap. So you can spend elsewhere if you're the kind of person that buys and sells based on the matchups each weekend. Yes. And just remember that Ramon Lariano is now on the guardians. He's a guardian. I learned that today. I don't know how that one slipped through the, (laughs) the sensors. I saw a tweet that he was the last remaining guy in the athletics from the 2018 team. Um, and then he, he got traded. So now they have none of the same players that were on the 2018 team. Wow. Um, that team had Sean Murphy and Matt Olson and Matt Chapman. They're pretty good mm-hmm. offense. Yeah. Um, but now, now they have a whole new squad. So yeah, wow. do not roster him. He is on the guardians. They are ranked 29th here and <laughs> probably don't want to yeah. play them. <laughs> yeah. All right. They're, they're not in for a good week. <laughs> All right, I want to talk about the Dodgers. Number one here, facing the Rockies pitching. Rockies pitching has been really bad this year. Um, Yeah, talking about the Braves and the Dodgers for me, definitely not sneaky, very chalky, but they both stood out a lot. They're going to be facing Paul, Bert, Kyle Freeland. Uh, The Dodgers ranked second in ISO, first in Woba, and first in WRC Plus on the year. Did you know that? Did you know that they were second, first, first in these categories? That is crazy. I didn't know they were that high. I knew, I would have said they were top five in all three, but dang. Yeah. Yeah. They've been crazy because even I would expect the Braves to be a little better. I mean, they obviously have great offensive stacks, but I feel like that lineup is so deep, right? Look at the Dodgers. I'm like, all right, Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, but like kind of a drop off. I know they rotate a bunch of guys, have some platoon guys down there, but. Um, obviously still a great offense and, you know, first in WRC plus, I mean, they're creating lots of runs that over there and they get the Rockies this week. So they're looking like great priorities. Mookie Betts at 92, Freddie Freeman at 77 for limited, and then a decent drop off for some of the other players. So yeah, pretty obvious. Uh, Dodgers, Nick, is there anything you want to add to these guys? Nothing to add there. They are extremely chalky and chalky for very good reason. So um, yeah. Anytime, anytime the uh, one of the best teams in the league plays one of the worst teams in the league, there <laughs> there could be some fun stuff there. Yeah, not in Coors though, in Dodger Stadium, but still see some runs. Yeah, it, it might not matter. All right, we are going to go to three for three, where we will go back and forth, talking three overvalues and then three undervalues each. These were taken from the So Ranks, which dropped this morning. And Nick, I'll tee it off to you. Who is an overvalue that you have? All right. These are the painful ones. Um, my first one is a guy I actually really, really like, but that's Max Freed. And this is mostly because he came back from injury and he pitched amazingly. And all of a sudden his price just shot up to the point that now he's pretty much on par with, you know, Corbin Burns and Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler and a few of the other guys where we continually talk about them as being aces that are undervalued. He's kind of a very, very low-end ace that has now, for me, stepped into overvalued territory. And so it's not that I don't like him. I just like him as more of a second-tier ace. And there's certain guys that you can get in that top tier um, for the same price. So if you could do a one-to-one swap and go get Corbin Burns out of this deal for Max Freed, like, I would do that every day of the week. Yeah, I think his price ballooned a little bit. Uh, he was the top overall pitcher in game week 36. Um, so, yeah, that makes sense as an overvalue. All right. The he guy... was a great value leading up to that. So it hurts me yeah. to <laughs> point him out now. But, yeah. Yeah. All right. The guy I want to talk about is Lane Thomas of the Nationals. He is once again on a hot streak. He was on a very hot streak earlier in the year, right before the All-Star break, I believe. Uh, so Lane's limited price is up to over $13, pretty high for someone on the Nationals. Obviously, the Nationals uh, not going to make the playoffs. One of the worst offenses overall throughout the whole season. Um, not expected to win a lot of games for this team. Probably calling up some of those prospects we were talking about earlier in the show. So, yeah, 13 seems like a lot for Lane and probably makes sense as a, as a sell high. All right, back to you. 
All right, let's continue picking on the Nationals. Uh, this is another guy that was a screaming value all the way into early this season, and that's C.J. Abrams. He's been playing amazingly. He's got good speed. He's showed good pop. He's only 22. There's a lot to like here, but he's now being valued inside the top 40 as far as like player cost goes. And as a middle infielder, that makes me start to wonder, like, could I trade C.J. Abrams plus a little bit of something for Bobby Witt? Could I do that for Trey Turner? Could I do it for an injured Bo Bichette? Like, those are all perhaps something somebody would take where it's C.J. Abrams plus, you know, another decent guy. And I would gladly have those other three guys just because I believe in them quite a lot more. And Abrams price has ballooned so much that suddenly that's not that crazy of an idea. So I actually like Abrams a lot. And if, if you're willing to hold through here, I would imagine his price actually evens back out at some point. Um, and you could buy back in, but right now, oof, it's hard to pass up a sell high like this. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of hot streaks, I mean, C.J. Abrams was on one of the biggest hot streaks I've ever seen, <laughs> you know, from a floor standpoint. He had double-digit points in like 10 or 15 games straight, something like that. So that makes sense as an overvalue. Yeah. He's looked really good, and he's yeah. he's got a lot of good tools, and he's still so young. So, like, there's a lot to like. Don't get me wrong. But player value goes up and down as the production goes up and down. So you, mm -hmm. could, you could make a nice... Uh, a nice bit of coin here just by knowing that players don't stay this hot forever. Yeah. All right. The guy I want to talk about is pictured here. Cody Bellinger. Um, I think like a lot of casual baseball fans know Cody Bellinger. He was on the Dodgers. He won the MVP in 2019. He is now in the Cubs. He was really hot for a while. And I was surprised when I looked at his limited price 31 for limited is, is really high. It was much higher than I thought for him but then i thought about it, i was like yeah i bet people like really do know him like casual players know him um you know he's also someone i thought who might get traded from the cubs of the deadline uh the cubs ended up not being sellers and then obviously went on the, the hot streak um i was talking about that with uh alec from sober in the states this week he's a cubs fan um so yeah bellinger 31 price very high makes sense as an over Makes sense as an overvalue as a sell high. Uh, Nick, what do you think about Mr. Bellinger? I agree. Um, the only thing that shocks me about him is I feel like he's been around a really long time for whatever reason. Like I kind of view him as this, maybe it's because he was traded and he was on the Dodgers and he, he's won a lot of stuff. And he was very, very good. Like I feel like he should be older than he is, but he's only 27. And <laughs> so the thing that gives me pause is, he's actually at a spot where maybe like we're actually just seeing him return to form. Um, but I, a lot of me just says he's also been really, really hot. So even if he is returning to form, maybe the average is somewhere between super hot Bellinger and crappy Bellinger of last year. And we can buy back in later because I agree. He feels like a really good sell high right now. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. You. Well, yeah, last but not least, um, you mentioned Sean Murphy earlier and he, you could see him as a cheap way to buy into the Atlanta stack. And I, I would get that to some degree, except he's not all that cheap for a catcher. And so part of me is like, yeah, you get exposure to that. And part of me is like, Oh, but he's a catcher and you can, just realize some value for this. Like how cool would it be to actually be able to sell a catcher at a premium value and go get some undervalued talent from somewhere else. And that's kind of how I view Murphy is like, I, I like the player. I like the stack. It does give you exposure to that offense. All that's good, but catchers in so rare just is not something I look to stack up on. And so when he's kind of outperforming his, long-term rank i'm all in on seeing what i can get for him yeah he's interesting like cheap relative to the other braves but yeah. overvalue relative to other catchers <laughs> that's how yes. good the braves are <laughs> yes that's a good way to put it yeah all right the last overvalue that i'm going to mention is tyler glass now 
I have the joke that he is made of glass because he <laughs> gets injured all the time, seemingly. Yeah, um, he's he's not allowed to go near anybody else on that pitching staff because <laughs> they're all also made of glass. And so if it's contagious or something, just keep him away. Keep him safe. Yeah, somehow he's not the guy who's out for the season. There's like four yeah. other guys who are out for the season. Um, but he, you know, we talked about him a lot here lately. He's been really good. Uh, he probably pissed a lot of people off a couple of game weeks ago when he had that. <laughs> uh, he was the top guy. He's supposed to start on Sunday, and then his start got scratched. He had back spasms, so um, probably screwed over quite some, quite a few people there. But yep. uh, we still have him here as an overvalue. His limited price is at twenty two dollars. Um, yeah, nothing more to be said. You can probably sell him for high, and I'll load up on some guys that aren't made of glass. All right. <laughs> We are Mr. moving on. Glass. <laughs> he has it in his last name. I mean, it's right there. I know. It's it, <laughs> it's the low-hanging fruit, and it, it works. I like it. All right. We're going to move on to the fun part, undervalue. Yes. And All I will right. tee it off to you, Nick, to mention a guy that you like. Perfect. So first guy I actually pictured here, and that's Brian Reynolds. Um, we mentioned him in the stacking section. He has a wonderful matchup this week against Cincinnati. And we saw what good Brian Reynolds can do at the beginning of the season. He was insane. And then he got hurt. And I think we've all just collectively forgotten how good Brian Reynolds can be. And he's finally back. He's finally healthy. And he's got a plus matchup. Like, this may be one of the last times we get to say, like, Brian Reynolds is a good buy low. Um, so matchup, talent, all that, all coming at a very, very nice discount. So I have him as a top 50 player. He's currently valued inside the top 130, which is really nice for a guy that can be sort of a cornerstone for you for many years to come. So Brian Reynolds of the Pirates. Yeah, I like that. I like Brian Reynolds a lot. And um, he might be featured on the value plus chart. I, coming a up. little bit of foreshadowing. <laughs> you, We might have talked about a couple of those guys <laughs> at this point. Yep. We will get to that section shortly. All right. My guy is the loser of the fight, Tim Anderson. The very got, aggressive <laughs> tagger. Yeah. He got knocked out the other day by Jose Ramirez. Um, <laughs> so the White Sox, like I said before, they have been winning lately. I don't really see that continuing. They are a team that's sold at the deadline. Um, they are not doing well overall on offense. Um, but Tim is super cheap. He's under $4 for his limited price. And we've had him in here quite a bit, actually. Uh, hasn't shown much power this year. I was kind of hoping he would get traded um, mm -hmm. at the deadline. But, but yeah, uh, any other thoughts on Tim Anderson, Nick? I was hoping he'd get traded, too, to some degree. <laughs> but um, we are seeing, like, glimmers of him kind of being the guy he used to be um i have a, a sinking suspicion that we're all going to write him off and we're kind of already doing that and then next year is the time where he's like oh yeah I, I got i got my swing back i'm ready i'm healthy like it's all good and so like this is a long-term play this might not help you a whole bunch for the next couple months but there's a lot to like about tim anderson's profile and provided he just returns back to sort of what he used to be like it's insane how undervalued he is right now so a lot to like there yeah. um speaking of you know plays that aren't going to help you at all for this year i've just got to say it because i don't think we mentioned him last week so this is just me reminding myself but Vinny pasquantino of kansas city is a wonderful buy low <laughs> No, he won't help you for the rest of the season, I don't think. Um, but if you can pair him with Bobby Witt for the next five to ten years, I think you're going to be really, really happy. And there is, there's a whole bunch of good stuff in his profile. I won't bore you with it. But this is like a, a dynasty gem that the fact that So Rare is structured the way it is, where you can buy him and then play him for the next number of years, like nobody is factoring that into his his market right now and that's great for us so if you can snag him 
do it and then just enjoy it later. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Dynasty Gem. I like that. That's a... <laughs> that just <laughs> happened. I don't even remember saying it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that makes a ton of sense. Um, haven't seen, really seen him this year. But like I said, paired with Bobby Witt, they have some young talent there. Uh, MJ Melendez, you know, not the mm-hmm. same, not the same player, but having a big game week, he's on that team that I have. That's top 100. So yeah. shout out MJ. All right. I will talk about the next undervalue that I have. George Springer. He just got ejected today alongside oh, the Blue Jays manager. Nice. A clip of that before we hopped on. Um, he has not been having quite the kind of season we're used to for George Springer. He is getting older. Um, but he has a hit in six straight games, multiple hits in three of those games. And I do like the Blue Jays lineup as a whole to do some damage. I'm going to buy low on someone. I do like it to be on some of these powerful lineups. George Springer leads off for them. Um, so I have him as my undervalue. All right, nice. back over to you. Yeah, you don't get a lot of chances on these really popular teams to buy yeah. low. And right now, actually, Springer and Bo Bichette, for differing reasons, are both good by lows. Um, so yeah, those Blue Jays could be kind of sneaky. Um, okay, so my last one is Seiya Suzuki. We talk about him a lot. He's kind of like a couple of the, these other guys where he's often injured, and so I feel like we're knocking him for... He just hasn't been on the field a lot, but there's a great profile here. There's a lot of power, a lot of patience, and a team that is kind of a surprising playoff candidate. Like there's a lot of talent around him to make for more RBI potential, more run scored potential. And if, if he can just get healthy, like he could be a key piece of this offense that more and more of those pieces are really, really appealing. So you can actually buy in here for a discount compared to going and buying, I don't know, Cody Bellinger um, at a premium. Yeah. And, and I haven't looked up uh, the Suzuki price, but I'm assuming you can get one Suzuki or excuse me, one Bellinger for about 15 Suzukis. Uh, <laughs> I, so. yeah, I don't know the exact, um, what is that? That would when be you, when you do currency. $2. <laughs> that would yeah. be. <laughs> when you do the currency swaps. Um, yeah. Su- Suzuki bucks are different than Bellinger bucks. <laughs> Suzuki bucks. I like that. All right. <laughs> Last guy I'm going to mention here as an undervalue, Carlos Rodon of the Yankees, back in the IL. He just got injured recently. I did read he should only need 15 day, a 15 day stay on the IL uh, for oh, his good. injury. He has a limited price under four dollars, which is really cheap for a guy that we know has upside. I mean, he was on the Giants for a while. Um, he was someone that I would target in DFS, high strikeout rate. Um, yeah, it just hasn't been healthy. You know, really in the Yankees rotation hasn't been healthy at all outside of Cole. I mean, Cole's been great. He always is. Mm-hmm. But man, has it been rough for the Yankees rotation. Um, so yeah, undervalue for Rodon. Uh, Nick, any additional thoughts on Mr. Carlos Rodon? I mean, this is one, he's just been hurt. Um, and like his talent is top 10 kind of pitcher. Like that's that's what we're talking about. And so yeah. if you can score that, for four bucks, like it, it's a no brainer at this point. Um, I think people held on for a really long time cause his price stayed nice and high for quite a while. And then it's, it's like, we, we sort of just got tired of him. Like we got tired of waiting and then he came back and then he got hurt again and we're, we're extra tired of him. But I think those that stuck around or those that buy in now will be the happier ones in the long run. Yeah. All you got to do is say top 10 pitcher, four bucks, and uh, that should be an insta buy. I could have stopped right there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Moving on to value plus for game week 38. We do see Brian Reynolds at the top. We alluded to him. I think we got quite a few of these. So I'll just run through it really fast. These are guys with great matchups that also come as um, undervalued in comparison to like what else you can get in the market for that same like or similar ranked player. So Brian Reynolds, Cabrian Hayes, a wonderful two-man stack there for Pittsburgh, which we talked is in a great spot. Rysel Iglesias, four games this week um, where they're probably favored in all four, and he's actually undervalued as far as closers go. 
Jeff McNeil and Brett Beatty, cheap ways to get exposure to the Mets roster, which is also playing four games. Julio Arias, which we didn't talk about, but the Dodgers on the flippity flop of playing against Colorado, Arias, I think he's on Sunday. So if there's a yeah. there's that third game of the week chance that maybe he gets pushed, but otherwise really nice matchup there. And then David Bednar, if we like Pittsburgh a bunch, um, it kind of goes to follow that we would like the closer there. Like if the Pittsburgh bats have three great games and put the team in position to win three times, well, that's Bednar's um, benefit there. So we could see some save chances for the Pittsburgh closer that we haven't really talked about much. Yeah. I like that call. Um, I like that little two man Mets stack. We got there. McNeil and Beatty. It's yeah. Nice. Uh, it might not be sexy, stack. but <laughs> But yeah, they're they're both values. Yeah, we didn't talk about the Mets stack, but obviously having four games pretty big mm -hmm. on the slate. Um, yeah, good stuff there. Um, all right, I believe that was our last. I think segment. we did it. So we can go ahead close out the show. And um, Nick, is there anything you want to say to the people before we get ready uh, to start up game week thirty eight? Oh, good luck, folks. Um, I hope none of you have to go to the DMV today. <laughs> and may your lineups score many many runs yes no dmv it's an awful experience and um, <laughs> yeah, somebody needs to retrofit the entire dmv process but that's that's a talk for a different podcast yeah well, we need some some ai to innovate in that industry that would there be you helpful. go um yes. <laughs> all right thank you everyone for watching and best of luck to everybody in game week 38 and we'll see you guys next time thanks folks good luck